Yes, please, no one. When can I help you? Please, 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 no. Now, why can I help you? I need a headquarters. He's got a make at 47. Shots being fired right now as we speak. Like a showdown with the old Western days. One is going to survive, or you can both put your weapons down and walk away. I'm Daisy Martinez. And I'm Derek Garcia. On June 4th, 2014, a love triangle turned into a deadly standoff between two armed men and a woman caught in the middle. As journalists, we keep ourselves out of the story, but as you'll see in RGV True Crime standoff on Orchid Path, we are caught in the crossfire. On the border with Mexico sits the booming Texas town of Brownsville. Fleeing Mexico's problems, the Reyes family set roots for a better life. Brothers Ivan and Milton have big American dreams, eager to start their new lives. When we came down here, it was like we had to be a team to get by, you know, to get through. Milton always looked up to his older brother Ivan. He was very giving. In 2014, the American dream became a reality. Ivan, a talented mechanic, shifted career gears with a new opportunity as a jailer at the Cameron County Carrizales Rucker Detention Center. The career sparked a new love interest, Monica Robles. I actually knew very little about her. I, I didn't know that he was seeing someone. Uh, I didn't know much about her at all. Boy meets girl, no big deal at the time. Ivan, a 31-year-old bachelor with ambitions and a steady career, was a total catch. But in the early hours of a hot June day in 2014, no one could have prepared the Reyeses for what was about to come. Brad, please, no one, when can I help you? Please, please, no. No one, can I help you? Who is this? A frantic 911 call for help. Monica Robles, the woman Ivan told his brother about, desperately calling for an ambulance to her home. It was one of those calls that, you know, you hope to never get, um, and then you just throw in some prayer too, because it it's, was not an easy call. Brown's on that one one. Ma'am, I need a, uh, I need a police call here. Another 911 call, this time from Monica Robles' brother, Carlos. He has my sister held up right now in her room. Brownsville police rush to the scene. Hello, sir. What's going on? There's a guy on the floor? Within 15 seconds, more bullets. Shot by headquarters. He's got to make it 47. The way that the call came in, it was a 911 call letting us know that there was a dead body and that there was someone kidnapped inside. Armed with a high-powered rifle holding his sister at gunpoint is her ex-boyfriend, Marco Gonzalez. She kicked him out of the home about a week earlier. Gonzalez, also a jailer for Cameron County. SWAT Commander Felix Sauceda is called in. It's time to pick up. We got to hurry up and we got to get to a call. SWAT goes door to door evacuating families. There was a whole neighborhood being held hostage. As a dispatcher presses for answers, Gonzalez grows more impatient as he scolds a helpless Monica. Well, I'm going to talking. If you're going to be rude, have some principles and some values. I need, to, I need to make sure that you're not going to hurt the paramedics when they get there. I'm not. I'm, I don't want this guy out of you. You could just tell. If I wanted to hurt someone, I would have hurt this girl that I'm with. Cause I'm out. Okay. Monica Robles was also making calls from inside the home. She called her ex-husband, Leo Galvan, to say goodbye. Please tell my son that I love him. Marco's gonna kill me. He's gonna kill me. He has a gun and he's gonna kill me. Leo told investigators there were more guns inside the home. Monica owned a 9mm handgun and Leo's M4 assault rifle, the gun Marco, is armed with. Marco shot Ivan in the head with your gun. Monica gave the assault rifle to Marco as a gift. She bought it from Leo. She hadn't paid it off nor transferred the title. When Monica ended the relationship and Marco moved out, he took the rifle. Monica asked for it back. On the morning of June 4, 2014, Marco showed up at Monica's house to return the M4 fully loaded. He insisted on going there 
to, to return the rifle. And she had asked him or told him, let's just meet somewhere. And he said, oh no, that's not the way it's gonna be. I'm gonna go return it to you. Ivan had been there overnight. Ivan was also armed. I don't think she ever thought in a million years that this was gonna happen. Officers went to Ivan's father's home but wouldn't say why they were asking about his son. Entonces yo hablé por, le hablé por teléfono a Iván. Le hablé muchas veces, muchas veces, y no me contestó. As his dad kept dialing his number, finally someone picked up. Who answered the call and the dramatic moments caught on camera when RGB True Crime continues. Marco's gonna kill me. He's gonna kill me. Marco shot Ivan in the head with your gun. En una de, creo que fueron más de 20 veces que yo le hablé. Entonces, me contestó la persona que le quitó la vida. Le pregunté por mi hijo. Me dijo eh, eh, la persona que, este, que le había pasado un accidente. Un accidente. ¿Qué le pasó a mi hijo? ¿Qué le pasó? Eh, eh, y me corbó. And it took hours and hours, and they kept asking, you know, my, my son, my family member, my brother. And it took all, those, all that time of him laying there, lifeless, in the, in, the, in the kitchen area, before we can finally tell him, you know, we're sorry, but, you know, he's gone. Hours pass, Ivan's bloodied body laid in the kitchen. Monica facing the barrel of an assault rifle. Marco wouldn't back down. The suspect was becoming agitated, was becoming more threatening, that was becoming, you know, more violent in nature of you would, aggressive if nothing else. At the police department, 911. Tell them to back off. Tell them to back off until 4.30, please. Just tell them to back off until 4.30. What is your name, ma'am? Monica. He said he's gonna let me walk out at 4.30. At 4.30, Monica? Okay. 4.30 p.m., no sign of Monica exiting the house. I okay. want the f***ing command unit, the SWAT team, even though I fire some shots up in the air. Policy procedures means whatever it is, just get the f*** away from Russia PD, you guys, and the SWAT team from the Sheriff's Department, okay? Besides dealing with an increasingly hostile suspect, technology also became a factor in this standoff, possibly working against them. A neighbor was filming the incident live on a smartphone and was projecting it and that's what that was a concern to us. He could be watching it. He could be seeing the, 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 live, the live stream himself. The live broadcast possibly gives Reyes a real-time view of what's right outside the front door. There are two people inside. And just as I went live at the top of the 5 p.m. newscast. Shots being fired right now as we speak. There was at least five or six shots fired right now as we speak. Earlier there was shots fired as well. The chief said that there had been shots fired inside. Inside, they did, they did not know if there were warning shots or what was happening, but right now we just heard several shots, five or six shots shot right now. They had also moved us off to the side because they believe that this man, whoever is barricaded inside, is keeping up with the news reports. They did not want him to, to see what you guys, the viewers out there, were seeing as we took our live shots. We weren't getting anywhere. The violence unfolding on live TV shows the severity of the situation front and center. There comes a time when you have to do something to rescue that person and bring this to an end. Before SWAT could go in, Monica stumbles out. Two SWAT members quickly move her out of harm's way. Following a nine-hour standoff, Marco Gonzalez walks out the front door with a self-inflicted gunshot to the gut. For the Reyes family, the agonizing wait is over. Police confirmed their biggest fear. Su hijo Iván está muerto, falleció. No hacía Iván muerto. No puede ser. Iván no está muerto. I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, why? Like, how? How does this happen? And why him? Uh, I just, I couldn't believe it. I was just, I was just a mess. Marco survived the standoff and gunshot wound. He is hospitalized and read his rights. But his legal battles were beginning. Attorney Ernesto Gámez takes Gonzalez's case as clear self-defense. 
and it ended up being like a showdown between like the old Western days, two guys facing each other and each were armed and whoever lived was gonna be prosecuted. And in this case, Marco survived, so he was prosecuted for murder, capital murder. The once county jailer closing cells is now in one, facing a slew of charges. Capital murder, aggravated kidnapping, and several counts of aggravated assault on a peace officer. This is not another country where you're guilty till proven innocence. It's your innocent till proven guilty. Viewers who watched the chaos live believed that this was an open and shut case, but it turned out to be anything but simple. The complex strategy, the standoff in the courts when RGB True Crime returns. A love triangle ends in bloodshed. Once a jail officer, Marco Gonzalez is now in jail, charged with murdering his ex's new flame, Ivan Reyes, holding her hostage and shooting at police officers in a nine-hour standoff live on TV. Now, Marco sustained a self-inflicted gunshot wound, and Marco says he killed Ivan in self-defense, but attorney Ernesto Gomez is tasked with getting a jury to believe him in separate trials, one for capital murder, another trial for shooting at officers. Jury selection is now complete in Cameron County. The standoff unfolded live, and the trials did too. Evidence showed Marco Gonzalez shot Ivan Reyes once in the chest and once in the head, arguing it was self-defense. On the stand, Gonzalez told jurors when he went inside his ex-girlfriend Monica's house and saw a man whom he didn't recognize, Monica yelled, gun! And that's when he pulled the trigger. When I went inside the house, I pointed the gun at him. He had the gun pointed at me first. If you're standing there and someone's pointing a pistol at you, what are you going to do at that moment? Are you going to be here facing murder? Would you rather have died? I had a, a gun pointed at me. It was not me. It wasn't was me. It was not me. It was, I was not Marco. And... Monica also took the stand, telling jurors she never invited Marco inside her home. I mean, there was evidence that he was planning and he got there that morning and he did it just like that. There was no self-defense. The evidence, the bullet, and the versions of events all play out on the evening that. news. Anyone would do that. What came next on June 12th was a shock to many. The man accused of killing his ex-lover's new boyfriend has been ruled a mistrial. A hung jury. Nine believed Margo was guilty of capital murder. Three agreed Marco acted in self-defense. Marco would remain behind bars, while prosecutors and defense attorneys face off in court again. A former Cameron County jailer acquitted of murder is back in court. Seven months later, in January 2016, the second trial got underway. Same judge, same legal teams. Invaded that house. Prosecutor Peter Gilman with the Cameron County District Attorney's Office tried to convince jurors Marco and Monica's relationship was rocky at times. They started dating in 2010, and he'd been kicked out before because of partying and drinking. Jurors saw this letter from Marco to Monica dated September 2012 to please take him back. She took him back and was kicked out again. Prosecutors made the argument Marco just couldn't stand to see Monica with another man Marco's attorney argued he didn't know Ivan was there when he showed up and stuck to his argument from the first trial. So many times, one side perceives facts and evidence one way, and the other side perceives facts the other way. On February 3rd, 2016, the jurors had a verdict. Not guilty. The idea of what happened is clear. Like the guy broke into a house and killed someone. How are you gonna find that person not guilty? While it was a big victory for Gamis, the district attorney's office wasn't done. He was acquitted earlier this year of murder, but is being tried on multiple charges from a 2000. Marco still had nine charges of aggravated assault against a peace officer. A third trial, same judge, same legal team. New victims, this time it was the officers including SWAT Commander Felix Sauceda. 
Attorney Gomez told reporters ahead of trial he would prove Marco didn't mean to harm anyone and had no previous criminal record. The SWAT team took the stand, testifying they feared for their lives when Marco shot from inside the home on Orchid Path at their SWAT unit. Gomez requested probation if his client were to be found guilty this time around. On October 3rd, 2016, the verdict is in. A major controversy was about to unfold at sentencing, accusing the judge and jurors of making a major mistake. The standoff in the courts when RGB True Crime returns. back to RGV True Crime. Marco Gonzalez is acquitted of killing his ex-girlfriend's new love interest, Ivan Reyes, after the jury believed his self-defense argument in a second trial. But what happened next, no one could have anticipated or prepared for. Guilty on all charges. The verdict the district attorney wanted and the family needed. This case is all about is how much time he's going to get. The next day, jurors returned to sentence Gonzalez and set off a firestorm of finger pointing. First on four family claims, justice was not served in the trial of former jailer Marco Gonzalez after he was given only a five year sentence. They say the jury was misled and thought he would be given five years for each count. Only five years? It's a far cry from the serious prison time the prosecution was working towards. Say tomorrow he can be released would be a joke. And the district attorney, Luis Sainz, was looking for an explanation. They issued a five-year verdict on each count, thinking in their mind that the judge was going to stack it and he was going to end up with at least 45 years. That was the mistake that, made, that they made. A mistake Judge Elia Cornejo Lopez disagrees. We don't know what they were thinking in there, but we know we have to respect them because one thing that they did is they heard the facts and then we can make them feel bad about their verdict. In the documents given to jurors, nothing mentioned whether or not charges would run concurrently or consecutively. The Reyes family, district attorney's office and Monica's attorney all believed something could be done whether it were appeals, investigations, or even getting the Texas governor involved. I don't know what they think I could have done differently. Um, I've never had someone tell me that they think I could have done something differently. In 2023, she's no longer the judge and speaks freely about the outrage and the claims, mistakes, or miscommunications were made to jurors. No, it's not, no miscommunication. I think what they could have done is make one charge. I think they were going for the guilty and then the number of years wasn't really considered. They being the district attorney's office and the one charged to potentially have a higher sentence. The judge is off the bench and back to taking cases and has detailed feedback on both sides, particularly on Margot's attorneys calling for separate trials. That, that was really a brilliant strategy for him because the jury may have convicted him in the first place. And I think the, the state should have fought that probably a little better. It's better to set a guilty man free than to incarcerate a guilt, an innocent man. District Attorney Luis Sainz declined to comment or be interviewed for this report. While the outrage for the five years was broadcast news, it could be no jail time. The jury sent this note to the judge at 4.27 p.m. They asked, quote, for the probation section, can he get jail time and probation, end quote. The judge replies to this note at 4.43 saying, answer the question before you without regard to consequences. At 4.55, the jury responds to the judge, we have reached our verdict. With credit for time served, a little over two years at that time, a five-year sentence meant that Marco was about halfway done with his sentence. Defense co-counsel Erin Gomez was fresh out of law school when she defended Marco alongside her father. The jury system is the foundation, the bedrock of our democracy. It's the ultimate calling that we can ask upon any of our citizens. And I never wanna shed doubt uh, or, or blame or cast any sort of 
uh, of accusation uh, to a member of the public. I think ultimately things played out exactly the way they were supposed to play out. And, and that is the system that we live in. The jury rendered a decision that, in my opinion, was a difficult decision. I will not, okay, in any form or fashion, uh, uh, embarrass, insult, demean the jury who had an extremely passionate case, difficult case, and they rendered their decision. I respect their decision. When you really piece it all together, that's not the way we saw it. We respectfully accept the way things turned out and moved forward with it. Uh, that would have brought us a little bit more closure and, and you know, sense of, of justice, but we didn't get that. Ivan's dad says the state failed to do its job adequately and failed to get justice for his son. Me acuerdo algo de mi hijo, que me dijo una semana antes que se muriera, nos dijo a su papá y a mí, me está yendo muy bien en el, en el taller, ya los voy a ayudar. Eso nunca se me va a olvidar, nunca. As for the man in the middle of it all, he is now out of jail. Marco Gonzalez was released in 2019. We were able to sit down with him for a few minutes with his attorneys standing close by. They did not agree to a full interview to allow us to ask about the June 4th incident. Marco says he regrets the pain he caused all the victims. For the fact is there's always a truth to the stories and, and, and my truth as he speaks for itself and uh, also indicated of uh, the charges that I was accused of. And I went to prison, did my time. And uh, I think it's time for the public to know that I'm a better person. I have remorse towards all the crimes that I committed. And I feel sorry for other victims of my family as well. He tells us prison was no child's play, but he says it was behind bars in the toughest of places that he found his faith. Uh, I started to read the Bible. I was a non-believer in the Bible. And uh, the Bible opened up one time with the AC. And I was able to read a portion of the Bible scripture. And it said, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. It says, for I walk by faith and not by sight. And since that day, I've been going by that model. I walk by faith and not by sight. He didn't reveal too much more about his life now, but Marco says he's holding down a job and spends a lot of time with his daughter and family who stood by him. If you could change things, you said you would have done a lot of things different. Right, I would have. For the Reyes family, whose lives were forever changed, these apologies aren't enough. Ya cambió, ya cambió, pero él lo va a pagar algún día. Él y todos lo que le hicieron mal a mi hijo Iván, lo va a pagar algún día con Dios. I mean, he took a life that he didn't have to. Do you think he's going to sleep at night just like you and I? I don't think so. Monica Robles declined to be interviewed. And the Reyes family tells us that looking back, they wish they could have been more vocal about this case and about who Ivan was as a loving son, brother, and friend. At the request of state prosecutors, they kept quiet in order not to jeopardize trial proceedings. They believe having the case moved to another county would have rendered the justice they were seeking. Thank you for watching RGV True Crime.